Welcome, everybody, to the No Normal Show for Thursday, October 22nd, 2020, brought to you by Revive Health. This is our weekly deep dive into how hospital and health system marketers can navigate what we call the No Normal. I am Chris Bevelo, health systems practice lead at Revive Health and your host for the show. I am joined, as always, by Chase Kleckner, who is senior marketing manager at Revive Health and the show's producer. Hello, Chase. Hey, Chris. Good to see you, as always. Good to see you too. We are also joined by Vic Rice, who is VP of Consumerism and Insights at UNC Health. Hey, Vic. Hello, Chase and Chris. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Glad to be here and thanks for the invite. Absolutely. Looking forward to diving in. We will cover off on some housekeeping notes before we do that. Uh, if you're new to the show, uh, on this podcast, what we do is we share industry trends, research, stories from folks like Vic who are in the health system space. Uh, sometimes we pull people from outside the industry, uh, essentially anything, any kind of idea, content to help health system marketers and communicators navigate what we call the no normal successfully. Uh, if you've not heard us use the phrase no normal before, or you want a kind of a deeper understanding, check out uh, the blog post that we wrote about the no normal a while back when we launched this show. Uh, it has five principles to kind of uh, stand up through the no normal. Chase will post that in the chat function for you, a link to that. Uh, if this is the first time you've joined us and you're a live listener to the show, welcome. Uh, we use Zoom functionality in a couple of ways. I mentioned the chat function a second ago. Uh, certainly feel free to use the chat function to talk to other attendees uh, who are here live with you. Chase will also use it to put links uh, to content that we're talking about. If you have a question for us, if you have a question for Vic or myself or Chase, put that in the Q&A queue. Uh, that's what we watch for questions. We will take questions as we go along. We should have time at the end for questions as well. Just make sure if you have a question for us, it ends up there and not in the chat function because we may miss it in the chat function. Uh, also, know that you can uh, subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. We also post a re video recording of the show uh, by the end of the day. So you will be able to find that by the end of this afternoon at our website at thinkrevivehealth.com slash COVID-19. You will also find all kinds of other content there related to COVID-19. We put out uh, content every week. We have a lot of uh, consumer studies that we've done all of that is there. Uh, you'll find quite the library. But if you want a recording of this to share it with people, that's where you go. So with that, I think we're going to dive into the conversation. Vic, are you ready? Yes. You know, as a, in this a virtual world, I know where the mute button is at. So sometimes there might be a delay because I always want to make sure I mute and unmute at the appropriate times. Well, it wouldn't be a Zoom meeting if somebody, you know, didn't start talking with the mute on. I think that's just a requirement. In this day and age. Uh, we wanted to talk with you about consumer insights because we know that's a, uh, not only just the passion point for you personally, but also a significant focus at UNC Health. Um, so let's just talk kind of broadly first about, you know, what do you mean by consumer insights? How are you using consumer insights in a significant way? Let's start there. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I honestly, I cannot, uh, you don't describe consumer insights unless I talk about the team. And you know, part of you know talking about the team is really, I would imagine, depending on where you are, how you uh, utilize consumer insights might be different, but let me uh, kind of illuminate how uh, UNC Health is approaching consumer insights. So as I talk about the team, uh, this is our internal dedicated team. Um, that team is responsible for assimilating consumer data and transforming it into meaningful, actionable insights that empower business decisions. And I really wanna emphasize empowering uh, business decisions. The team mobilizes and activates against secondary data, uh, both quantitative and qualitative me uh, primary methodologies. And our goal is to understand and predict consumers' behaviors, attitudes, and uh, motivations, and also to identify where and how to play in existing, adjacent, or emerging market category opportunities. So by doing so with the establishment of our internal team, uh, we have new capabilities to know consumers 
and what drives their attitudes and behaviors. We are able to build an emotional blueprint to understand consumers mm. and emotions that connect their values and their desires to UNC Health. And finally, our goal, and this is still a work in progress, is to cultivate a consumer culture so we can um, have coworkers that are able to thrive in a consumer-centric um, um, enterprise. So I'll pause there, but I can also add, you know, some of our work um, prior to COVID and work during COVID, um, if you want me to uh, provide further details. Yeah, I think that would be great. Give some examples um, first from before COVID. We'll get to COVID in a little bit, but um, I think that would be fantastic to hear. All right. So prior to COVID, you know, our team in a short period of time built a solid foundation. Uh, listening was the uh, glue. Um, that was uh, a principle, it was a foundational principle, because we really wanted to use insights to inform internal decision making. In a short period of time, um, our consumer insights team, a champion, uh, you know, really sponsored social scraping uh, research studies, demand analysis, uh, launched our new consumer segmentation, and also supported, you know, our dual uh, transformation initiatives. Then, as I tell everyone, um, we were humming along, had a great trajectory, had started looking down the road into the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, then there was COVID, so I'll pause there. <laughs> So, so talk a little bit about like, you've, you listed a lot of things there. Can you give an example of, of, of how you had tried to apply some of that um, to a marketing initiative? You can pick whatever one you want um, before COVID. And then we'll talk maybe a little bit about COVID. So one of the things that we are undergoing um, is a digital modernization or, you know, I try not to say transformation, but um, I've landed on digital modernization strategy. Um, so you imagine there are so many examples and we don't want people to become what I call toolified. Here's the latest gadget. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. Because that's the tendency when people think of digital, they think about all these tools, these apps and you name it. So we actually said um, we want to always start and we want to build a discipline where we start with the consumer insight. Otherwise you get what I call Frankenstein digital. It depends on whatever some people decide to stitch together. So that meant honestly that that might delay that initiative because we had to spend time building that discipline. Even though we all think we knew where we needed to head, but we said, let that be rooted um, with uh, informing our digital uh, roadmap based upon a uh, digital insight. So part of that you know, study um, included focus groups where we actually held uh, focus groups. And this is before COVID. So we were actually able to go into homes and we were able to sit down and see how they were approaching that, that consumer job to be done from a digital perspective. So it was both quantitative and qualitative. And we used that to really build the uh, I would call it the roadmap on how we should be able to uh, approach the next phase of developing the digital modernization um, roadmap. And then COVID hit. So, so talk a little bit about what happened when COVID hit. Like, did it, you know, how how did all of this work that you that you were doing? How was that impacted by COVID? Did it just derail it completely? Did it actually? help you in some ways talk about a little bit what happened particularly over the spring but even mm -hmm. as we've come through this it's hard to believe it's already almost november um, that we've been dealing with this for seven months <laughs> now but start in the beginning yeah so okay and there was covid and the, the best way to describe it in my opinion is that if you're driving a car and then uh, you see the need to change lanes so essentially we change lanes and changing lanes is not necessarily a bad thing right uh, sometimes you have to change lanes, or as I say, you have to slow down in order to uh, speed up. But probably the best example, if, we were, if this were a recording, we hit the pause button. So what we did um, with Consumer Insights, all was not lost. We quickly realized we had a strong uh, foundation and infrastructure that was already in place that it could power what I call it more agility. So we activated the team to rapidly get an assessment as far as what is going on in the uh, market. 
you know, how are people perceiving our brand, what's going on within the triangle, what's going on across the state, um, and any reticence um, that um, was apparent among consumers. We also uh, expanded the capability of the team, as you can imagine with COVID, that was a content rich environment. And so the consumer insights team also became a part of the content work stream so we can inform the development of new uh, content based upon some of the insights that we're picking up, gaps that we believe that we had um, in our uh, content, but also as I tell people, the ability to look ahead and based upon those insights, anticipate um, some future uh, content needs. So it was actually a good you know, opportunity for us to stress test um, our infrastructure. Um, I don't believe the, the first report, I don't think anyone asked for us to do it. It was as we're taking a look at how can we support, because you can imagine with COVID, a lot of it was operations and rightfully so. We were trying to mobilize to be able to take care of the population. So we, again, and as I always tell people, we have to have a business mindset and be able to say, what does a business need? And so on um, the team, I'm um, definitely started looking at uh, external perceptions that we could use um, for um, internal decision-making. Yeah, so talk a little bit about that because when we were you know, discussing what to cover for the show, you mentioned um, a lot of things you're talking about really helped get you a seat at the, the leadership table. Leadership was needing help um, to navigate the COVID-19 crisis. And there you were um, because of your consumer insights, be able to provide value that maybe you wouldn't have been even asked before. Can you tell us a little bit about that opportunity? Yes. Um, so first of all, I know you guys are in Nashville. So I'll, I'll lead into that uh, answer by saying I have a confession. So I am an Indianapolis Colts fan, which means I am a- oh, wow. Fan. So I know you're in Titans country and I apologize for any of the other participants if uh, I'm offending you by being a Colts fan. But, uh, you know, when he was playing with the Denver Broncos, there was a Monday night game when people heard him saying Omaha, Omaha, Omaha. Talk to Indianapolis Colts fans. We were smart. Whenever Peyton Manning was at play, uh, was uh, playing, we were quiet because we knew he was going to go to the line of scrimmage and call an audible. So the reason why I bring that one up is, as you can imagine, with COVID, um, all healthcare systems, including UNC Health, uh, we had to call an audible. Um, so um, our mission here at UNC Health is to improve the health and well-being of all North Carolinians and those who we serve. So our mission never changed, only the how. So to go back to the question as far as what was needed to be at that uh, leadership, uh, that seat at the table for leadership, was honestly to be driven by data and informed um, by insights. So we had something of value based upon our value proposition and our capabilities. And I'm going to make up a word if you allow me. So our team was able to factivate. And so when I say factivate, wow, I like that. Activate with facts. Um, so that's what we brought when we walked into the room. So that seat at the table didn't mean we were controlling the table. We were at that head seat at the table. In some instances, it meant that we were a, we were a contributor. In some, it was a consultant or we were a work stream lead. So when I reflect back, a uh, couple of things that I believe allowed us to solidify that seat at the table because you know so far we have not been uninvited. So mm -hmm. I think people have uh, come to respect is that the value of our team has been proven because we brought the receipts. Again, we came with a strong bench of the insights that we helped empower the decision making. And it was in real time. So we were able to generate updated insights, probably at the cadence of maybe seven to 10 days. Um, the team also uh, discovered and brought forth you know, opportunities for improvements. We all know as leaders, Leaders are proactive and not reactive. And so the team was not shy about bringing forth those recommendations. The third is our team was that we were direct, uh, but delicate, correct. We again, knowing your place, but as I tell people, we like to engage in straight talk without a chaser. Um, and the fourth or the final two points is that the team, we're not afraid to take risks. 
uh, not being afraid to rock the boat. I always tell people, um, you have to be willing to call the baby ugly because no one calls their baby ugly. So, but sometimes you need people who are courageous that will. And finally, um, their ability uh, to have that seat at the table is, is our ability to see around the corners and to anticipate, you know, what's next. Great. Just a reminder to folks, if you've got a question for Vic or myself or Chase, put that in the Q&A um, Q in Zoom, and we will get to as many of them as we can. Um, so, so talk to us also about how you're leveraging consumer insights from an internal perspective. So most of us typically are thinking about marketing, um, like you said, consumer segments and um, all the things we need to do to be more effective with our marketing dollar, uh, but also understanding how insights can support internal communication. So talk a little bit about that. Uh, glad. Um, you will hear I have a lot of uh, strange uh, sayings or strange quotes. That's just sometimes I, I read a lot of books so some things are fresh. But I look, I, I look at it this way is that uh, we have to be careful that we don't step over a quarter to pick up a penny. Not that I'm calling a quarter a penny, a customer or an employee, but the focus is that sometimes we're so focused on you know something else and let's say what we're going to do externally that we forget the thing that's more the most valuable, the valuable that's in front of us. So the other thing is that um, sometimes we're thinking about our consumers, you know, as in an external sense. Our coworkers at UNCF, we call them a coworkers. So you know, employees, they're uh, they're consumers as well. They consume, you know, health. They consume healthcare, so they are an important audience. So we were able to expand our capabilities to model internally what we have been able to do um, externally. And so a couple of scenarios, examples internally, um, in fact, probably the most recent is that our team was activated to perform an internal di uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, survey based upon uh, the current um, situations in the market. Um, prior to COVID, uh, when we were at that point of most healthcare systems, the recovery phase, um, we were prepared to launch our Safe Promise uh, campaign. And again, that was based upon strong consumer insights. Uh, then we had an aha moment. They said, hey, um, before we launch the consumer, uh, the Safe Promise uh, campaign, let's make sure that uh, we are communicating um, in a campaign method to our uh, coworkers so before we actually launched the campaign, we were ready to go. We delayed it about a week to make sure that we had strong messaging. Again, with that mindset that they are consumers as well, they're humans, let's uh, provide the reassurance that uh, we have a safe environment um, and just all things on um, safety. So the, the point there was that that was well received and that's a discipline. Honestly, from my previous days, you always wanted to make sure that you're intentional with uh, your communication efforts with an internal audience. And sometimes in the hurry phase, sometimes it's easy to forget that your internal audience is also an important audience. Let's face it, externally, if people know where you work for a healthcare system, they are going to ask uh, your opinion. And you wanna make sure that the message that you are communicating externally is the uh, internal ambassador uh, can uh, reinforce um, that uh, message. So our model, the same way we do quantitative and qualitative, we also apply that internally. So of course, I would say, I wouldn't call it easy, but again, quantitative is, you know, that's a given, but having that discipline to also take time to supplement that quantitative with the qualitative um, portion with internal focus groups we have found that that has built, you know, tighter connections and it illuminates what the quantitative is not able to uh, produce. Got it. Okay. So, you know, as we think about the path of COVID kind of hit us in March, you talked a little bit about where you guys were headed before all this. Um, you know, we're all familiar with how it went down in March and April, you saw hospitals shutting down their elective surgeries, opening back up, depending on where you're at in May or June somewhere, um, and then since then, a struggle to one degree or another to get back to, to normal in terms of volumes. Um, we continue to see stories in the news about 
uh, patients not being back at the level that they were before. Um, depending on who you talk to, some health systems are, they feel like their volumes are in a pretty good place, but they'll even caveat that by saying, we still feel like this is a lot of the backup. That's why we're at a good place. Um, sometimes good place is defined as we're at 95%, which as we all know in this business is better than where we were in April, but 95% is not good with the margins um, that we have to live with in healthcare. So as, as UNC Health continues to try to move forward and right the ship financially and get volumes back to where they were, talk about how you're leveraging consumer insights now um, at this stage of where we're at with COVID. Uh, again, you know, people always say, hey, great question, but that's a question that I'm definitely excited um, to um, answer. Um, I always start here, and this is a yin and yang of what I call uh, consumer research or, you know, difference in market research and insights. And I always tell people, is it better to know what's happening, which is consumer research or why it's happening? Sometimes I tell people, maybe it's not a choice, maybe it's an and. It's good to have the uh, market research and why it's happening, but oftentimes people stop at what's happening, but they never go that extra mile to understand why it's happening. So to me, that is a fundamental principle around you know, consumer insights where we you're able to gain a deeper understanding of how an audience thinks and feels. Now with COVID, I think that is critical because I would say it might change. Uh, if you had to talk to me six weeks ago, you know, everything was looking up, you know, it looked like, you know, COVID was, you know, para-COVID and all of a sudden you look up, you know, it's like, here we go again. So when you take a look at the consumer that uh, back and forth, um, you really need to be able to peel that onion back to understand, you know, how that consumer um, feels. So I'll use two examples of why consumer insights are important is A, is the first thing is about consumer jobs to be done. So I think that's fundamental in any environment, understanding the job to be done. Why is that consumer, patient, customer, whatever you wanna call that individual, why are they hiring you and what are they hiring you for? Now, the, uh, the other side of that is during COVID, I argue that there have been consumer jobs to be done dislocations. And so what I'm after is to figure out, you know, what are those dislocations? Um, so to me, um, that's something that I'm chasing to make sure um, it's not um, business as usual. The second one is around the principle of a tolerable attribute. And I'll use an example. Um, we all remember Blockbuster and I hate to pick on a Blockbuster, uh, but as of 2004, they were a $6 billion enterprise humming along. Underneath that story, 16% of their revenues were from late fees. So they, consumers were tolerating Blockbuster because they did not have a viable alternative. So when I take a look at healthcare, how many of our patients and our consumers are honestly just tolerating us because there is not a perceived viable alternative. So that's something I keep in mind in addition to those consumer jobs to be done. So when you talk about the importance of consumer insights, it's uncovering those dislocations, but also being honest is that uh, I argue that, you know, there's certain parts of how we administer healthcare today that could be perceived as a tolerable attribute. And so I'll close out the answer with this. So what does this mean for a healthcare um, and I read an article earlier today, and I'm going to steal uh, some of, uh, you know, one of the phrases I saw, and, and I would say, we need to be gross, G-R-O-S-S. -S. Um, they said, get rid of stupid stuff, so I don't want to offend anybody and call anyone stupid. So I will say, we need to get rid of sluggish stuff. You think about it, uh, most of us on an annual basis or even on a quarterly basis, we will get rid of items and donate to uh, Salvation Army or the Goodwill. The point is we're trying to curate room for other, you know, items. But I would argue that sometimes in certain businesses and industries, we don't get rid of that legacy thinking, that proclivity to engage in rinse and repeat marketing and communication. So it's difficult to grow or to expand when you have all of this other stuff 
and I call it sluggish stuff, you know, that's weighing us down. Uh, final comment is that for healthcare, all this means is change, and I get it. No one likes change. The only person that likes change is a baby with a wet diaper. <laughs> that's the only person that likes change? That's depressing, Vic. We can't, somebody else has got to like change. We'll find that person. We'll find the people who like change somewhere. I wonder if um, we do have a question. We'll get to it in a second. Uh, one of the things that we've been watching out for, because you you have been seeing it, and I wonder to what degree you've seen it in your con consumer insights is, and I think this is a new phenomenon, though it's not going to be a surprise to anybody related to COVID. And that is, um, oh, there's a, a phrase for it, COVID fatigue. So what I mean by that is, you know, we've all had this kind of experience. I'll, I'll share mine personally, where I hadn't been inside a restaurant since this started. And I'd say a couple of weeks ago, I went to meet my buddy. We always go to Buffalo Wild Wings to have a beer and have wings, right? But we we're able to sit on the deck, right? This is before we had seven inches of snow. I'm in Minnesota. Um, it was nice enough to sit on the deck. But we went there and it was, the deck was closed for the season. So I'm like, all right, I'll go sit inside. And I, you know, we all mass on and all that stuff. And I feel like, you know, it's just kind of just like this incremental, you kind of just give. Some people, it's not incremental. Some people are like, screw it. They're going to the restaurant. They're not wearing masks, all that kind of stuff. But for those of us that are trying to like follow the guidelines, over time, you kind of like take one more step and you take one more step. And as time has gone on, we've all felt like, okay, how long are we going to have to do this? We're going to, you know, they're saying it's going to get worse. And um, I wonder to what degree we are hearing that or sensing it in our consumer insights and what that means for health systems in terms of the communications, right? So washing your hands and six feet apart and masks, um, there was education and then there was kind of making sure everybody did it. But I feel like we're going to have to double down on, yeah, every, nobody likes doing this. Nobody wants to keep doing it, but we've got to maintain. We've got to have resilience. We can't have fatigue and just give in. Thanksgiving's coming, Christmas is coming, holidays are coming and people are gonna be more likely to just go, you know what? I'm just gonna take that chance. And if we do that on a mass scale, it's not gonna be pretty. Are you seeing or hearing any of that Vic in the, in the work that you're doing or the insights that you've got recently? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, going back to March, um, we're able to, you know, measure, uh, you know, that fatigue and we've actually um, had that question and we're able to see how it has evolved over time. So we definitely um, see where, you know, again, the, the one thing that hasn't changed is the authority that people that, you know, people trust, you know, um, mm -hmm. and, and ironically here. Um, you know, the governor, right? But then you get, you know, to the federal level, sometimes, you know, that drops off. So that's the good news, right? But we have um, seen uh, consumer fatigue. We also had picked up that sometimes what people are saying that they're doing, uh, uh, that they're purporting to do, and we were looking at some of the behavior, uh, and this is back when I would say everything was locked down, right? You know, mm -hmm. And we were looking at the traffic, um, we were seeing that people are saying that they're not going anywhere, but did we notice over time that um, people started to um, increase their movement? And so, yes, uh, 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 COVID fatigue is real. I would say we even had a conversation in a content team, could have been maybe two months ago, um, we didn't know if we should pivot, right? Because um, we saw that consumer, uh, the COVID fatigue, and we're like, people are COVID out, right? We were you know, having our cold Rocky celebrations where when a COVID patient was uh, discharged, of course, you know, it was big on social. So then we were having that moment. Should we uh, move away or pivot away from uh, COVID uh, communications? And we decided that uh, it's an and, right? Let's do COVID, but let's also talk about, you know, some other elements. So that is a concern. Um, that we don't want uh, our audience to basically block us out, right? It becomes yeah. um, noise. The way I've approached it is that um, then we just need to dig deeper instead of maybe talking, you know, at people, you know, talk with them, use more of the principles of what I call game framed messaging to really tap into the things that, you know, are positive and forward looking because right now, 2020 has been a tough year, right? Would have thought 2020. Um, I think we all want to opt out of 2020. <laughs> need to have people that are looking, um, you know, forward looking. So that is a concern. The good news is we saw it level off, but not to a level 
um, where we believe, um, you know, it's a um, issue. And then the final point is that, you know, you overlay politics. So I think there's just been a lot of noise in this crock pot. Uh, some things have been politicized. And so the one thing that people are, is they're looking to their local, you know, healthcare system, those physicians to be the single source of truth. Yeah, for sure. So you just answered the question in a couple of ways. The question we have is, are you able to share some key insights? I think you just shared a few. Are there others that you could, you know, like, is there is there an insight that you guys have come across that was surprising to you that you could share with people? Um, or one that you think is really important um, as you think about how you move things forward? Um, I wouldn't say... In- Sometimes I, I might downplay the aha uh, moments, but I honestly I think this is something that, you know, as I've talked to um, people in other markets, and the reason why I will focus in on this, because this is also, um, a, you know, a warning for all of us in healthcare. So, you know, through our insights, we also take a look at uh, demographic groups, right? And, um, and I would say the thing that has been glaring is that, you know, how, uh, you know, healthcare is probably left behind some of these underserved communities. Um, and that, you know, that tears in my heart, right? Um, so the way they look at healthcare, when you get in, you know, to Blacks, Latinx, or some other groups, um, we have work to do. So when you're thinking, of, when you're talking about COVID, um, and we are already, we saw that early on in our insights, um, that those underserved populations were at risk of not uh, you know, from COVID being impacted by COVID, then all of a sudden here comes the tsunami of national reports. Um, and then I, there was a point where it's like everyone kept talking about it as if these groups were data. So my point is, mm-hmm. are you going to do about it? And so one of the things that we saw early on is that when we picked up that, uh, that data, especially around getting COVID tests, um, I believe within a week, um, there might've been slightly longer, but, but not by much. We actually had mobilized uh, mobile testing, um, a mobile testing um, unit that we could uh, deploy into some of these targeted areas where we are seeing that um, you know, the cases of COVID, that percentage of positive um, was at a unusual rate. Um, and so today we still have the mobile testing units um, that are going throughout um, the city and we're able to rapidly deploy based upon a need. So that was something that aha moment um, that was uncovered um, in insights. And you could argue it was with that insight that um, made it easy to build a business case to uh, get to resources in order to mobilize, um, you know, mobile testing. As we go into what I would call the vaccine um, you know, next year, I tell people we had to get with 325, 350 million individuals um, vaccinated. Uh, we have to make sure we don't leave out uh, these underserved um, communities. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. I like how you pointed out that um, even some of this, which, you know, health disparities have been with us for forever. COVID has really shown a spotlight on them. Uh, but data and insights like you said, can help you make the case, can help you make the business case. Um, and we just see that so often when, you know, there are things that you assume or things that you believe in, but getting other people on board with those, um, it's those insights and that data that really helps do it. Because it, to some degree, it becomes inarguable. It becomes, well, this is, this is what it is. And we could decide not to do something about it, but that's a different discussion than we're not sure that this is even a situation. So um, I think that's important. Talk, talk a little bit about the future and you can talk about it in terms of, I mean, unfortunately the future, as long as we see it is still COVID laced, that's a phrase. Uh, but where are you going with with the, the insights and particularly, you know, you haven't talked a lot about it. We haven't asked you about it, but the idea of consumer centricity as, as the outcome of, of how you use a lot of your insights, where is this all headed for you? COVID or no, where do you, where do you see it going? Uh, great question. So uh, we're on a journey um, and that's from, we want to move from consumer also to consumer always. And so it's a journey. So we, we haven't arrived at that destination, but man, definitely we are rapidly <laughs> going down that pathway. Um, I would say we will continue to focus on our building blocks of consumer insights. The first is that 
We want to continue to be able to gather the insights um, for the enterprise, be able to mine internal, external data sources, primary research. Uh, the second is that we want to continue to educate, democratize meaningful and operational insights. We don't do those insights and just hold on to them. We like to share uh, um, to all parties up and down uh, throughout um, the healthcare system. The third building block is that we want to make sure that we activate against the insights. You know, you can have the insights. What are you going to do with it? Let's put these things into um, um, action. And finally is again, is really trying to going back to that consumer always cultures. How do we really nurture and tend to a, a consumer obsessed um, culture? For me, when I take a look at the future, because sometimes I'm able to, as I say, I, I wanna make sure we always have that discipline of being able to dream and be uh, forward um, lookers. You know, first of all, as I've told, you know, I tell my team, I've told others, uh, you can't enter the same river twice. The water has moved on. And so when I hear people saying we're trying to return to this state, this normal, it's not going to return to whatever state you knew it is going to be redefined. Um, so I to tell people we need to not bounce back, but we need to bounce forward. And so we want to lean into what that looks like. So I always tell people, and I'll leave you with a couple of uh, Vic-isms, uh, snow mountain edges. And so when I take a look at the future, that snow mound that you're looking at is what I call it a traditional healthcare, the way we've always done it. If you go closer, it's melting at the edges. And so I believe we all have blind spots, but it's important for us to make sure we go out to those edges to see what is happening and be able to take that back into our organization and into the C-suite to effectuate change. The second one is we need to make sure that we avoid uh, linear thinking. Um, uh, I believe it was in Rita McGrath's book, uh, Seeing Around Corners, um, and linear thinking is imagining a future when, and, and well, when only one thing changes. And so uh, the parable that she uses or example was the Jetsons cartoon, which I actually love. Second to Scooby-Doo, I love the Jetsons uh, cartoon. More than the Flintstones? Oh, no, Flintstones, no, no, no. no. <laughs> But the Jetsons is because it was futuristic. You know, when you saw robots, you know, flying cars and what we consider drones, that was great. But the one thing that they said, these things would change, but it was based upon a gender reality of 1962. So when you take a look at it, they still had the gender roles of 1962, but they had a forward looking future of the 20s, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, 2020 era. So we have to make sure that we don't uh, make that misstep and assume that some things change, but others will not change. The third, the one that keeps me up at night is uh, the recovery. You know, some people have said V recovery. Some people have said W recovery. Some people have said L recovery. I think lately more people are settling around the notion of a K recovery. So if a K recovery is likely, that means obviously some people will, some, some portion will see growth but there will be some um, segments that there will be negative growth. So then how do we adapt uh, for a possible K recovery environment? And the final two is uh, keeping it front and center. What we have to do to uh, make sure we reach um, these underserved communities. And finally, um, people are in search of wellness. Um, no one wakes up in the morning, uh, Chase and Chris and says, hey, I th I'm thinking about getting sick in seven to eight months. So let me start doing my research and let me start looking at all these hospital systems. Let me read their brochures, their website. No one does that, but what people are on a daily basis is trying to be the best version of themselves. So they are actually in that space of what I call you know, health and wellness. And so what does that look like for us to make sure that we are um, you know, top of mind, uh, tip of the tongue in daily interactions? Well, we're huge fans of that. Um, we've been we've been pushing on health systems for years to try to to figure out how to provide value in between those incidents of care. Because if you look at those incidents of care across a lifetime, there's a few spikes. It's all the space in between uh, where there's opportunity, right? And you mentioned that the snow melting from the edges. It reminded me of one of my favorite books. Maybe you've read it, but if you haven't, if you want to kind of 
dive deep into that concept. It's called surfing the edge of chaos. And the, the author there talks about um, evolution and how evolutionary changes happen with like the, you know, if it's a, if it's pigeons, it's the weird pigeon on the edge that all of a sudden figured out, you know, like grew a third wing. And that, that's where, that's where the transformation ends up coming. It's not from the main group. It's from some weird thing on the edge. Um, and so I encourage people at the books, probably 10 years old, 15 years old, but I was looking to see, I probably have it on my shelf. So there it is right there. Surfing the edge of chaos. Go get it. Um, question, question that came in. Um, how are you integrating your insights uh, with patient experience? So maybe just quickly describe what role your department plays with patient experience, because that varies from system to system. Some cases, it, it's a very, um, you know, marketing leads it or co-leads it, and other times they're completely separated. So give us a sense of that, and then how much of what you're finding is being brought into the, the actual experience. Yeah. So, you know, right now uh, we see it as more of a collaborative and uh, points of integration, um, you know, perspective. Um, we have to be careful is that I'll always tell people that sometimes you don't want to own and dominate. You want to influence and make impact and make sure that it's um, seamless. So we have uh, monthly uh, meetings with the uh, patient experience team. So we share tools, we share, you know, what we're finding. Um, you know, I would argue sometimes, you know, you get into this yin and yang, um, you know, a patient means, okay, sometimes that person that might be laying in the bed, right? And then you have to assume or someone who's trying to avoid laying in that bed. So, um, but I think the key thing is, is to make sure, um, I would say real time. So you take a look at the press gainy. So how can we augment uh, what every healthcare system gets with press gainy? With some things that um, are, I would call a pseudo real time to help illuminate the time decay that sometimes you might get with the press um, gainy. So those are fluid, you know, conversations. The good news is, is that you know I've been with UNC Health maybe 16 uh, months. Uh, you know, initially you could think, you know, walk into a healthcare system to work consumer, you might look like a unicorn. Uh, but that, you know, that's not the case anymore. Um, you, you don't have to work, apologize and, you know, spend the first 30 minutes of your meeting explaining, uh, what a consumer is and why we, why would we be doing anything with a, um, you know, consumer, but every once in a while that question, you know, comes up. So we are at that point of, you know, collaboration and integration to make sure that we are doing what's best, you know, for the uh, consumer. And we always, you know, kind of joke and say, hey, and I think it was Jeff Bezos that said, you know, this empty chair in the room that represents the patient or the consumer. So let's make sure we are doing what's best for that patient and consumer and make sure our decision making is um, going to do what's best for that person, not my tool, not where I sit um, uh, in the organization. And Great, that's it. Oh, go ahead. What's that? What was the second part of the question, Chris? I want to make sure I answered it properly. No, that was it. I think you covered it. You covered it well. In fact, you covered it well. That's like a perfect close to the to the show, I think. That was a perfectly crafted answer. It's a great place to end. This That was fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, Vic. Uh, thanks for the uh, invite. If I could uh, just leave with, uh, you know, again, with the, the uh, COVID numbers increasing, and I just wrote it down here. Wear your mask, watch your distance, wipe down services, uh, surfaces, excuse me, wash your hands. And this is a, the other W. So you probably thought you knew all the W's, but this is a Vic W. Uh, take time to write a kind thank you note to your coworker or frontline worker. Oh, I like that. I like that. Was that, was it five W's there? You got it. All right, perfect. <laughs> I have to try to give some original authorship on here. <laughs> Well, I like the Vicisms. I think that is the thing right there. I think that's the thing you should trademark the Vicisms. Well, will you come back sometime? Can we have you back sometime? Yes, if you invite, uh, if you invite me back, um, I was joking with you. As long as you guys don't get low ratings, so if the ratings, <laughs> I'll be back. We we for many reasons do not talk about ratings on this show. Ratings are not a focus of our show, and I won't get into why. That is the case. Ratings is a it's a dirty word around here. Yeah, I think you, I think this is great. We really would like to have you back. You, you know where to reach me. All right, perfect. Chase, as always, sir, thank you so much for joining, for helping. Absolutely. Enjoy all the, the things that you do. 
Yeah. If you want us to cover something that we haven't covered or you want us to cover deeper or you want us to bring Vic back for something, let us know. Put that in the chat tool right now. Uh, you can also shoot us an email at nonormal at thinkrevivehealth.com. Next week, we will continue the conversation around consumer centricity with Kendra Calhoun, who is the SVP of Strategic Marketing, Communications, and PR at Avera Health in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and many places beyond. Remember to visit thinkrevivehealth.com slash COVID-19 for a recording of today's episode and all of our content related to this crisis. Also remember to subscribe on iTunes if you don't already. And until next week, good luck out in the no normal. Thanks for joining.